My intention in running for the presidency is preventing America from taking part in another world war. Your choice is not between Charles A. Lindbergh and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It is between Lindbergh and war. What if Lindbergh does win? Everyone sees what he is. To most people in this country, there's never been a bigger hero in their lifetime. The Jewish people and the Roosevelt administration yes. are pushing the United States into He's calling this war agitators. Listen to that crowd. There are so many who don't trust him. And I'm gonna do my best to convince them otherwise. There's a lot of hate out there, and he knows how to tap into it. Admittedly, Mr. Lindbergh made the statements grounded in anti-Semitic cliché, but he did so out of ignorance. This is how it starts. Since everywhere he goes, Hitler beats down and shoots the Jews, there may be a time when he comes here, to America, to beat down and shoot us. What will our president do then? We only think we're Americans. Maybe it's too early to leave, but it's not too early to have a backup plan. I'm tired of turning my cheek. Charles Lindbergh is a hero! This is not an evil man, not in any way. Tell me, Herman, does that begin to address your fears? Una mattina mi son vegliato, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Una mattina mi son svegliato, ho trovato l'invaso, oh partigiano, portami via. Oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 partigiano, portami via, che me sento di morire. E se muoio da partigiano, oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 e se muoio da partigiano, tu mi devi Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College and Yeshiva University here in New York City. What do we mean when we bandy around terms like fascism and authoritarianism? Is America entering into a form of one or the other or a combination of both? Is it a creeping fascism? or a form of neo-fascism? Is it a fascism with a friendly face? A neoliberal fascism? An American authoritarianism? Or an inverted totalitarianism? Is it a structural historic American version of which Trump is both a symptom and an endpoint? Does it matter what we call it? And if so, why? George Orwell referred to it as bullying. 
everyone who wasn't a fascist sympathizer would understand what that meant, he thought. The terms have become the rage and topic of conversation and debate among many scholars, activists, media pundits, politicians, and everyday Americans concerned about the future of our democracy. Perhaps most on people's mind is whether Donald Trump is a fascist, an authoritarian, a demagogue con artist, or someone with profound emotional issues and an authoritarian personality, or a combination of all these and more. Most importantly, for many, the question is, what can we do about it? We are really honored and thrilled to have on the Radical Imagination today one of the world's foremost scholars on fascism and authoritarian leaders, Ruth ben -Gajiat. Ruth is a renowned cultural critic, writes extensively on war, authoritarian propaganda, the media, and Donald Trump. She's a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. And her two eagerly awaited forthcoming books, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, and Strong Men, How They Rise, Why They Succeed, and How They Fall, are coming out in early November, and they're going to become basic texts to understand what modern authoritarian leaders have in common, the playbook they use to stay in power, and most crucially, how they can be stopped. As she puts it, ours is the age of the strong man. Russia, India, Turkey, America are ruled by men who, as they have risen to the top, have reshaped their countries around them, creating cults of personality which earn them the loyalty of millions. So welcome, Ruth. I, I'm so pleased to have you here. This, uh, as I was semi-joking with you before the show, I have so many questions. I know everybody is, is so interested in what's going on. We, we may have to extend it for two or three more hours. But seriously, no, the show is an hour, and we, we have a lot to talk about. And thank you so very, very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to just uh, uh, reassure your, your, your uh, viewers, they don't have to read two books by me because uh, The Strong Man, uh, it's the same book, but one is the U.S. edition and one is the U.K. edition. Okay. And they're coming out within a few days of each other in November. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that, that uh, insight, and uh, we'll be looking forward, uh, forward in uh, early November. Um, so, listen, to get beyond the weeds here, we're not trying to be academic, uh, you know, to cut through the academic jargon, but why is it important to get these terms straight? It's, it, right, fascism is obviously a loaded term. How should we come to view it and use it in our world today to better understand what seems to be happening in this country and, and in many places around the world? How do you use it? And how would you, yeah. perhaps, um, as you've pointed out, you prefer the term authoritarianism. So tell us the difference and why you've chosen that. So fascism is a form of authoritarianism, and it's, as most people know, it's a form of government that, uh, fascism, that depends, it's, it's a dictatorship, only one party, no opposition permitted, no opposition press, um, you know, Mussolini, Hitler, Franco, uh, those are the main exponents. And um, I prefer to keep the term fascism for that time period. And why is that? Um, it, it, it can be misleading to say that we have fascists in power today because um, we associate fascism with the total extermination, often very quickly, of any opposition. And in countries like in India or in Bolsonaro's Brazil, you have, or Trump's America, you have leaders who definitely use tactics inspired by fascism. Right. So 
fascism is present in the things they do, in the things they say, but um, many people point out, well, if we had fascism now, you wouldn't be able to be talking. You know, CNN fake news wouldn't even exist. You couldn't publish your pieces. So I prefer to use the term authoritarianism because what, what the people who are in power in the world today, the strong men, they're taking from fascism, but they're also taking from a larger heritage. Like Bolsonaro is, is taking from right-wing authoritarianism, in particular the military dictatorship in Brazil. So each country has its own heritage. Um, Trump very much plays on uh, the GOP and the and the whole legacy of uh, racially, you know, suppressing votes of non-whites. Um, and some people say that the South had a form of, of authoritarian rule. So we we can see fascism as a system that had legacies that live on today. But what people like Putin and the rest are doing is broader than fascism. It's authoritarianism. You, you call it the new authoritarianism, right? So how, yeah. again, what does that mean? So in, in the, my book, Strong Men, um, I, I designate three periods of history. There's the fascist period. There's the age of military coups. Um, many of those leaders, like Mobutu and Pinochet in Chile, were right wing. Uh, some were left-wing, like Gaddafi, but all of them did similar things in terms of uh, extirpating liberties. Then we come, to, after the Cold War is over, to the new authoritarianism. And I chose this term to talk about leaders who keep the trappings of democracy. For example, they keep elections in, in uh, Hungary under Orban, in Turkey under Erdogan, even Putin's Russia, you have elections, but they are manipulated. They are voided of all real meaning, and they are used to keep the authoritarian leader in power. So things work differently today. You don't have a one-party dictatorship. Um, you don't usually get rid of all opposition, uh, other than in North Korea or in China, and those are communist. So, but for, for rulers who... Um, Live, live on in the heritage of right-wing authoritarianism, it, it's not accurate to say it's like a fascist dictatorship because that's not how it works today. You also use terms like <clears throat> managed democracy, yes. uh, personalized <laughs> authoritarianism. Um, so what's the nuance there that you're trying to get at? So in, in the book and in a piece I published recently in the New York Review of Books, I talk about this form of authoritarian governance called personalist rule. And this is a term used by a lot of political scientists. And it's very useful to talk about rulers whose personal needs, personal desires, personal corruption um, deals come to influence all of society. They come to, they mm. take over their political parties and for example, the, GR, the GOP has become um, completely wrapped up in, yeah. in Trump's defense. And the same thing happened in Italy under Berlusconi. And he was the pioneer for this. It, he ruled in a democracy, but he was a personalist ruler of authoritarian traits. And his party, Forza Italia, became an instrument of his private needs. All it did was, um, mm -hmm. you know, protect him from what he called witch hunts, from prosecutors, from the media. And so, so the personalist ruler is like almost like a parasite who comes to influence, uh, wrap society around his own agendas and his own needs. And these personalist rulers have always uh, marked authoritarianism. And a famous example is Hitler, who's, um, who's you know, private obsession with the Jews, which was shared by many Germans, of course, and many Austrians, but it came to set state policy. So you have situations in which the personal quirks and character traits and uh, financial needs of one man, the ruler, come to influence state and society. Uh, let's get back to Hitler. Did, did he have, um, how would you describe 
this per was it a personal vendetta that carried on um, into this his political career? Um, what what did he have against the Jews? Um, th there are many theories. Being right. Hitler, there's an enormous literature. Right. Uh, everything from psychoanalytic interpretations that talk about his mother having had cancer and the Jewish doctor couldn't cure her. So she died of it. And this was a huge trauma to him. Um, we can look into uh, society at the time. There was, there was rampant anti-Semitism. And, and indeed, most of his biographers uh, concur that it was when he moved to Vienna to try and get into the Academy of Arts, which he was rejected several times. He wanted to be a painter or an architect. Um, he became immersed in these anti-Semitic currents of the time. And, and then he became quite obsessed. Uh, these are personalities, these authoritarian personalities are um, very similar throughout history and being obsessed with enemies um, and cleansing society of enemies who they secretly personally fear is a trait, whether it's Hitler or Gaddafi or up to Putin and Trump today. So you mentioned the term, the, the classic work by Adorno, the authoritarian personality. Okay, social psychology. I, I mean, you're not, are you saying that this is a form of mental illness or what do you mean by that authoritarian personality and bring in that classic work to your own interests if you can. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not defining it exactly as Adorno um, and company defined it. Uh, there are many things that I don't agree with about that formulation. For example, they, they felt that any kind of, um, you know, non-heterosexuality was deviance. There are things that are of their time that yeah. don't translate well today. Right. I think that um, the authoritarian personalities in history, it, it's, it's remarkable the constancy of these men who have gained power and ruined their societies. And they are, um, of course, they, they have, they're amoral. They have uh, obviously an absolute domination, uh, a, a, an intent to dominate. Uh, Trump said recently, if you're not going to dominate, you're wasting your time. That's what governance is about, is dominance. They uh, are uh, very thin-skinned, very insecure, which they cover up with this bluster. Um, and, and these are things that entered into Adorno's formulation, but also go beyond it. And his, his book was very much a creature of its time, and it was based, uh, understandably, a lot on Hitler. And a lot of the critiques early on of um, fascism and authoritarianism were based almost solely on Hitler and the, the German exile community that spawned so many important intellectuals, including Arendt, um, they did not take Mussolini seriously. And this was a mistake uh, because Mussolini actually, his trajectory is more applicable to what goes on today. Um, he did not, um, when he came to power, he ruled for three years in a democracy and he slowly eroded that democracy, but he wasn't taken seriously by any of these people. And so the way we talk about authoritarian personalities is based on too limited of a sample in a sense. Yeah. And recently a lot of books have come out, uh, Dean Hancock and, and others that have broadened uh, the, the, the base of examples. And so we're in a new phase spurred right. by current events right. of evaluating what the toll is of personality and what the personality versus society. And there's a movie that just opened yesterday uh, called Unfit mm. um, that I'm actually in. Um, and it is, it has psych psychologists in it and historians and others talking about, in this case, uh, Donald Trump. But it's about um, how certain pathologies uh, in, in leaders can have a big uh, and disastrous effect. Well, look, okay, unfit, all right, terrific. Um, and not to, again, go back to that earlier work, but did Adorno 
wanted to call it the fascist personality. And he also had a scale, the F yes. scale, fascist scale. So uh, this has been going on for a while now in, in intellectual circles. What do we call it? How do we try to understand it? And so on. Uh, and you mentioned, of course, Hannah Arendt and the origins she, she's concerned with totalitarianism. So again, uh, and, and why don't we just also mention um, Jean-Paul Sartre and anti-Semite and Jew. So again, these earlier classic works, how did they, how have they been updated and how do you bring these works again into your understanding today? Um, and how should we take them? I, I do. I, I think that Hannah Arendt had extraordinary insights uh, about how power operates, how violence operates, um, how bureaucracy and violence and power intersect in toxic ways. So yes, absolutely. Um, I also think it's important to um, talk about the critiques of fascism and authoritarianism that came from post-colonial thinkers, from Fanon to Memi. Um, they, they, had, they also had extraordinary things to say uh, coming from their point of view. And Arendt was one of the first um, Western thinkers to acknowledge that uh, many of the um, tactics of, of authoritarianism came from imperialism like the, the institution of the concentration camp. Um, and so one of the things I, uh, the reason, for example, I wanted to include Gaddafi of Libya in my book is that there, there is a trajectory where Mussolini invades Libya and the Italians, are, well, Libya was already invaded before, but Mussolini increases Italian presence in Libya. And the Italians are in Libya for 30 years. So they had a footprint of many institutions and then Gaddafi comes along and he ends up kind of, um, he, he's very against all Western influence, but he ends up using the same violent tactics and some of the same propagandistic tactics as Mussolini, the man he hated more than anyone else. So there are through lines in authoritarian history that go from right to left, right? Um, right. They're not the two totalitarian um, regimes that Arendt dealt with. Arendt was interested in, you know, especially Stalinist communism and Hitlerism. So I, I have these insights in, in the book, but I have a broader trajectory because, um, and the same with Mobutu in the Congo, he was <laughs> resolutely anti-imperialist in one way, but he used all kinds of violent and um, censorship that had belonged to uh, fascist and imperialist regimes. So it's a more complicated picture when you take it global. And it was very important for me to tell a global story and show how, you know, these fat, so after fascism fell, you had these orphaned Nazis and orphaned uh, fascists. And sure, some of them went to Paraguay and, and we know those, you know, the stories of Mengele and others went to Chile eventually, and they helped Pinochet. Mm -hmm. So there are through lines there too. Fascinating. No, no, that's incredible. A really profound point you're you're making here. So it's at times the the people who've been victims have become fascistic or authoritarian themselves in their attempts to so-called liberate their people. I mean, is that what you're? There was a certain. Um, I think that. It, the age of military coups, it went two ways. There were the right-wing military coups, a lot of them backed by the U.S., as we well know. Mm. And then there were the anti-colonial coups. Um, and, and the ones that I focused on uh, are the ones that turned authoritarian, such as Mobutu, the ones who be, they became dictatorships, very mm. long-lasting dictatorships. Mm. And, and there you see those influences. Um, and so you have this kind of, the book is structured around the authoritarian playbook. And these are tools that all of them use. Um, and I don't have communists in the book. I'm sorry, yeah, have, I just, who are you including in the book? 
Yeah, well, so who, I, who don't I have? I, have in, I don't have communists in the book because uh, I'm very interested in people who wrecked a democracy or some semblance of democracy. And uh, yes, at the beginning, I mean, Russia had never, was not a democracy when Lenin and Stalin took over. So I don't have communists in there, although there's a lot of interplay that I talk about. Um, so I have Hitler and Mussolini, and I show how Mussolini hugely influenced Hitler and how much more important he is for the history of uh, fascism then and now than he's usually credited, you know, gets credit for. And then I have Gaddafi and Pinochet, and I talk about this new wave of post-fascist authoritarianism and Mobutu. And then I get, and then I have Berlusconi, who's in the 90s and early 2000s, and he's kind of a bridge uh, to these, this new style of authoritarianism that can take root in a democracy and then slowly kind of degrade it. And Berlusconi never did away with democracy, but he, he was with his corruption and his censorship, uh, his private ownership of you know 80% of the state media, uh, of the of Italian media. So he had a very deleterious effect. Um, and then I go on to the kind of new authoritarians of today. But the idea is to show that what we're living today, what we're living through today in America, it's rooted in American history. And we have lots of incredible American historians who have talked about that. My contribution is somebody who never studied American history. And I, I came to looking at Trump with the eyes of someone who had studied uh, fascism, you know, elsewhere and global history. Um, one of my fields is empire. So it, he, what Trump is doing and the people who are around him have roots in this larger history. Um, Roger Stone and Paul Manafort worked for Mobutu. <laughs> they worked for Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. Okay. So, um, and, and so, and Trump, you know, of course there's Bannon who has consciously modeled himself on a kind of fascist, neo-fascist playbook. So what we're going through in America can't only be seen in the lens of American history because it's, it doesn't explain the whole thing. It, did you get into some of the um, dictatorial rulers uh, in the Middle East, in the, in the Muslim world? Or did you um, consider putting Netanyahu in some sort of authoritarian category here, Prime Minister of Israel? Yeah, I, I didn't, I have, what I decided to do for narrative effect is to uh, have certain examples who I follow, certain people who I follow throughout the entire book. And then other people like Duterte come in. Um, Netanyahu is not in the book, but he certainly fits the profile in terms of um, also, you know, uh, trying to avoid trial for corruption. Um, he, he does many of the things in the authoritarian playbook. And so the instruments of this playbook are propaganda, uh, violence, corruption, and also uh, one of the contributions I'm making is to talk about masculinity and virility. And that, over the course of my research, it, it, I realized it was so important that it needed its own chapter. So now I have, uh, and it interacts with the other tools. So for example, if you're um, like Trump and Berlusconi and Putin and all these very corrupt leaders, they make getting away with breaking the rules a kind of measure of uber masculinity. Yeah. So there's a model of manhood and it goes back to Mussolini. He was the first. It's very consistent. They all have a certain way of being a man. Hitler's a little bit different. Uh, uh, he's a little more complex. But um, this idea of the man who can do what he wants and get away with it and no one can stop him is crucial to authoritarianism. But political scientists um, have not factored that in. I'm a political and cultural historian. so. I, I'm able to see, to, to treat those things. Um, but all of them, um, these, these tools, they change over a hundred years. So the media is very different than it was in Mussolini's time where you had just radio and newsreels, right? But the strategies 
of creating an alternate reality and cults of personality uh, and being corrupt, they are remarkably the same. Yeah. Um, so many things are going on through my mind right now to ask you. Um, how do these people, uh, start with America, the American experience, how can they resonate with so many millions of people who become their follow followers and the cult status? I mean, how does one explain that? The, 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 how does such an expression, uh, again, of racism, fashion, the hypermasculinity, what's the appeal, um, particularly in the United States and across the, across the world, it seems? I think that what you see over and over again is um, at certain times that are perceived as times of great transition, often there are times when there's been incredible progress socially uh, for women, uh, for, um, you know, for gays, for workers. So times of social progress um, create this kind of counter reaction. And that's one uh, constant you have in, in Spain in the early 30s and in, you know, and then you had after World War I, women had become emancipated. You had it uh, after uh, Obama, eight years uh, of Obama, ruled by a black man. Many people never accepted that. So Trump read correctly the audience and put racism as one of his major things and has tried to consciously, he's got a personal obsession with undoing everything that Obama did. Um, so that's part of it this kind of um, appealing to people who didn't, don't like the changes going on in society. Um, and, and then there's this very, um, this other thing they do, which can seem to contradict what I just said before about them being uber masculine. They, they talk about victimhood a lot. They talk about the country as being victimized um, from Hitler and Mussolini did that very well. But they also pose as victims in a funny way, victims of their enemies. And so they get people to actually feel care for them. So on the one hand, they're bullies, right? And there's a section of people who like it that they're bullies. They get very excited in having someone who threatens to shoot someone like Trump did or, you know, uh, Bolsonaro threatens murdering, you know, leftists. And they do this while they're on the campaign trail today. This is the new authoritarian thing. Duterte says, if I get elected, I'm going to butcher people. So there's a segment of people who like that. We just have to accept that they like that. There's another segment who, who kind of, again, see them. Uh, they want to protect these men because these men are victims. And so this is important to the bonds of loyalty. So. So the smartest of these guys, they, they use different ways, but the end result is that they get this loyal bond with the people. And, tr and Trump started out by having loyalty oaths, which is what scared me and sent me running home to write an op-ed for CNN when I saw one of his rallies, because I recognized this very clearly. And once those bonds of loyalty are forged early on, it's very difficult to break them. It really is. Um, because all of the subsequent history um, can seem like it's playing out the victimhood of the ruler, right? As people start to oppose him because he does outrageous things, he can say, well, I'm being victimized by the culture. Um, right. And part of, of course, Trump's playbook was Nixon and the use of law and order, as you say, even though he's constantly wanting to get away with the rules and break the rules, he also appeals constantly to issues of law and order, uses the military and violence. Um, you know, you also point out the stress, the importance of memory in the face of this historical denial. Uh, uh, Henry Giroux, who we had on a couple of weeks ago, calls it organized, the violence of organized forgetting. Yeah. Why is that so important? To create an alternative reality in which they then get to be violent? And it's, it's, 
the memory aspect's very interesting and Giroux has, I like his, I like his writings and his ideas a lot. Um, what these strongmen actually do is they have two registers. One is utopia, where they say, everything's crap around us, everything's bad now. I'm going to lead you to a glorious future. And they become, and then they become anointed. Religious authorities anoint them as uh, tapped by God. And so they become the only people who can lead to this glorious future. And that's why a lot of Mobutu and Gaddafi were called the guide. That was their titles. Mm. And sure enough, you know, Trump, the most amoral, unreligious person on earth, this is very typical, um, was recognized by evangelicals and some Orthodox Jews as kind of divinely guided, right? Yep. So that's, so we have forward looking utopia, but they also channel nostalgia for a great past that was lost. So when Trump says we have to make America great again, the again is key because almost every one of these rulers, starting with Mussolini, who looked back to the Roman Empire and said, we're going to revive the grandeur of Italian Empire. Hitler had, he didn't have, he didn't do the nostalgia part. He just had the kind of uber fantasy of the race, the perfect race. But Erdogan talks all the time about the Ottoman Empire. And Putin talks about the Russian Empire. And, and Bolsonaro talks about the law and order past, which is the dictatorship. And bin Laden also referred to a glorious um, Muslim past, correct? Yeah, so this is part of this mindset. And it's extremely compelling to people because it, it, it's, it's saying that your past might, it, it appeals to people who feel threatened, right? Right-wing authoritarianism, one of the, a lot of studies are about um, it, it calming what some social psychologists call the death, you know, death terror, right? Or a terror of being overwhelmed by leftists, by women, by whoever is your particular, you know, bogeyman, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so you have this future to look forward to, but you also at the same time have this, past oh it's going to be like it used to be the good old days before we had a black president before we had you know right this and that yeah black lives matter yeah yeah so and and all of this is done over and over again and it was really even to me it was rather shocking when i went back through 100 years of history and saw how they all do the same thing the context is totally different the outcome is totally different. Again, today we don't have one party dictatorships. We don't have Gaddafi who ruled for 42 years. <laughs> we don't have that. But the strategies are the same um, and they work really well. Yeah. And one of your major interests of course has been the media and talking about that, the propaganda machines. Tell us the role that's played through the decades and particularly Today, what about the corporate media? Are we standing up? How do you deal with a Trump in the in the in, in, in the mainstream media? Are we are we are we getting our people to be serious enough about these threats? One of the tragedies is that uh, societies are never prepared for these charismatic authoritarians, and they don't know what to do. Um, we have less ex excuse because there's history that's happened over and over again. But we were uh, had this kind of it can't happen here. We're a democracy. So one of the things I've tried to do, and you know, I've written over a hundred op-eds now since 2016, uh, is to kind of do civic education to to show what has happened in the past and also shift the frame, uh, people's frame for how they consider Trump. Because ironically, our great respect for democracy and for the office of the presidency is getting in our way. Because Trump is not in power to govern in any traditional democratic sense. He's there as an autocrat. He's there to exploit the country, to make you know money off of uh, public office. Um, and 
and get as much power as possible so he can stay in power and avoid prosecution. Those are not democratic goals. And the media has, they approached him, they approached the ritual of the press conference and all of these things with a, a democratic era mindset. So for example, the very, very first uh, times they had press conferences and Trump told one of the media to sit down and shut up. Um, and the person obediently sat down. I remember watching this and saying, oh, what needs to happen right now is everyone has to stand up in solidarity and ideally turn around and walk out and deprive him of all of his oxygen. Absolutely. Had they had there been a big show at the very beginning of group solidarity, because these men are pushing the envelope constantly. They're seeing what they can get away with. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. so the media, just like all of the other institutions of our society, was not prepared. And um, it, there's also human denial. People don't really want to see that it's that bad because then they don't know what to do about it. Um, CNN, which uh, is, is, you know, been really consistently anti-Trump's, still had on Kellyanne Conway. And at the very beginning, they didn't want to use the word lying. They, so everybody was, in my book, from where I sit, way too slow. But from the corporate media world, they were adjusting at a conservative pace. Um, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked well at all. And what do we have 60 plus days to the election? Are we prepared now? Are we really ready to for what may happen? And are and, and what do you feel might happen? Um, we're, we're not prepared in the most important way, which is, uh, and, and part of this is not our fault, uh, election security. We inherited um, a system that maybe didn't need to have some didn't, didn't need it. They didn't have a strong man trying to consciously manipulate. Although the GOP has always manipulated elections. It has stricken people from the rolls. It has, the GOP was already in my book, an authoritarian party uh, as of, you know, after the Tea Party came on and they have become a lawless party a long time ago. And the way they approach elections is the best uh, proof of that. So nothing was done about those things. So we're certainly not prepared um, to face the, the level of election manipulation that came along, uh, at, at, that, that caused, that helped Trump to get in, uh, allowed for Russian interference. We're not ready. Uh, what might happen, it's very hard to say, uh, but if, if uh, there, were, there would need to be an overwhelming um, numerical victory for Biden in order for there to be no contest. And even so, uh, I believe Michael Cohen, Trump's uh, former lawyer, when he says that Trump will not go uh, you know, smoothly, he will not go quietly because he, he, he doesn't wanna go to jail. Um, it's very basic. Um, if he leaves, he fears he's gonna be ruined and his tax records will be accessed and the whole thing will come crashing down. So he's going to cling on there any illegal way he can. Um, and after that, I, I don't know what will happen. Um, I know what he'd like to happen. He's already trying to have uh, so much civil unrest, uh, so much polarization, people in the streets, that he can kind of have some martial law or authoritarian crackdown. That's what he wants. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, where do you think the military is going to come down on all this? I know it's impossible to predict. I mean, but do you think that we have a situation, a history of, of that sort of militarism where we would allow that to happen? Do you think the military, the generals, would go ahead and go along with this? It's, it's not clear. In fact, the only thing I thought, um, there was one thing I thought I'd been wrong about, um, which I had thought that because so many retired generals were speaking out, and I had thought that the military was not for Trump at all. And, I, and so when Lafayette Square happened and the military occupation of DC, 
I thought, well, okay. And, and also way before that, he, Trump bought off the military, giving them huge budget increases and giving them a purpose domestically. And what he's done is turn, turn the, bring the war home and give them a function, ideally, that they're going to repress their own people. And there's where he, he echoes uh, right-wing authoritarians like Pinochet, who turned the military, that well, Pinochet military, the Chilean military was totally devoted to democracy until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the sad things about that situation is how fast everybody just fell into line. Um, so Lafayette Square was a very interesting testing point, and, and many officials came out and said, we're not going to do that. But the rank and file, we know that there's radicalization in the ranks. I, I think they're split. Um, so it's, it's hard to know what is going to go on. That, that's, a, that's a wild card, I would say. Right. And so, again, as your book is... It's, and your writings have been telling us, how do we resist? What can be done about this? I know you, you talk a lot about uh, it has to be uh, nonviolent. Um, I know your admirer, as I am, the show is with Reverend Barber and the moral movement. He's attempting to um, lead. Uh, I, I, we, I want to mention, too, that we've had a, a couple times on the show, a fellow uh, who is a member of Antifa, who's a, taught at John Jay College. Actually, very much admires your work. Uh, but the, again, um, the feeling, what is your feeling about groups like Antifa um, or, or resistance that maybe blur the line between violence and, and, and uh, you know, civil disobedience and so on? I think the, the big the big danger of using any violent tactics is that they become turned against you by um, their, their people in power, uh, you know, chief among them, Attorney General Barr, who's an extremely dangerous individual, I think, very subversive and dangerous. And he's just salivating to lock away uh, anybody who uh, destroys property. He's, they're already trying to, you know, uh, talk about them as domestic terrorists. And in doing research for the book, I looked at the state level. I looked at state laws for, against protest. And there's a, there's a tracker. Um, there's an organization that has a tracker state by state. And protest against uh, around pipelines and environmental sites, because money talks, and universities had already, uh, there's already many attempts on the state level to, be crim to criminalize it. And West Virginia even passed a law that said that police who um, kill someone in, in enforcing, you know, in the protest are not liable. Mm. Um, so we have to look at that too. Uh, but th this, so the problem is that there's already this very strong rhetorical action to present Antifa as lawless and, and, um, you know, destructive Marxists and all of this recycled rhetoric. And so when certain individuals, it could be two individuals in a crowd of 100, and those two become the poster people, and it discredits the 98 others. Um, that, that's the problem. Uh, and that's always been the problem. <laughs> Uh, throughout throughout history, except when you have a situation of war like the resistance in World War II, a totally totally different situation. We have members, some of the members of the old New Left, like Mark Rudd, coming out and warning, "Hey, don't be stupid here on the left and progressives. Don't do what we did, what he did, and and take that violent route." Um, no, your point's very well taken. Uh, we only just have a couple minutes. Let's try to end on some sort of um, happier moral note. What, what what are your feelings about Reverend Barber and the um, moral movement to to transform American society and uh, the, you know the Poor People's Campaign, et cetera, and his yeah. attempt to uh, raise consciousness about border suppression and the way in which uh, the system divides and conquers us? Because that's also what fascist authoritarians try to do all the time. 
So. I think I'm a huge admirer of Reverend Barber and his movement and, and of others who are trying to, um, pr to preach solidarity and uh, horizontal bonds uh, among people and empathy and compassion, all of those values that uh, strongmen leaders hate because for strongmen, it's all about the vertical bond between the people and the leader. And one of the saddest things is that these, all of these men secretly despise the people who love them. They, they couldn't stand, they can't stand them. They, they, they look down on them. So sooner or later that dawns on people, often it's too late. So any, so any movement uh, that is preaching, uh, you know, love for each other, um, compassion, solidarity in the face of tyranny, elevating uh, the moral climate uh, uh, against this obvious corruption is is really important, uh, and it and historically it can have an effect. Um, there are, there are cases in which it's it's been very important to change the climate of a country. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, Ruth, it has been an honor, a pleasure. I admire your work so very very much. Uh, can't wait to take a, a look at the book that's coming out. And, and again, you're in this film called... Unfit. Unfit. So we can just Google that and and see that and see you yep. in it. All right. Terrific. Thank you so very, very much again, Ruth. Um, Thank you. And uh, continue the great work you're doing, research, and raising our consciousness and, and awareness and education. Appreciate you so very, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Much, much great love to you. Thank you. And thank you all so very, very much. This is Jim Bredo saying goodbye for the Radical Imagination. We'll see you again next week on the Radical Imagination. One fine morning I woke up early Bella Chow Bella Chow Bella Chow one fine morning, I woke up early to find the fascists at my door. Oh, Partigiano, please take me with you. Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, goodbye, beautiful. Oh, Partigiano, please take me with you. I'm not afraid anymore.
Thank you. 